Um, so what is early careers hiring? What is our goal? So it's a massive question. How do we even try and keep up? The world is changing so quickly. It's becoming you know, increasingly challenging to stay with. And I live with some Gen Zs in my house, so I know how challenging they can be to keep up with. Um, so I think the fundamentals haven't changed. We are trying to find those candidate, candidates with the most potential um, to become future leaders in our organisation. That's not changed. So the, those fundamentals haven't changed, but technology is changing, society is changing, candidate expectations are changing. And as we see more and more automation playing a, you know, a really large part in some of those entry level roles, our focus has got to change on targeting those individuals that will be able to lead our organisations into the future. So the future is going to look very different. I've been doing some reading recently and looking at some of the stats, you know, by 2030, all of those sort of low level cognitive reasoning tasks that people are sort of, you know, doing day in, day out now are highly likely to be, you know, less important. And that sort of higher level cognitive reasoning is going to be playing a bigger part. So, you know, as, as an organisation, as an industry, we've got to try and keep up with that and predict what some of those trends are going to be. Um, so, yeah, it's looking at finding those individuals that are going to be able to lead our organisations into a somewhat changeable future. So what does this mean for you or for us as recruiters, as um, employers? How do we, you know, how do we, how do we keep up? So as a reminder, Gen Z, I do have to write this down, they're, they're mid to late 90s through to the early 2010s. I think the boundaries do vary depending on where you're reading it, but essentially that's around about the, the, the period that we're talking about. And they do currently make up the majority of, of early career um, candidates, no surprise to yourselves. So I think this means as recruiters, what does this mean for us? We have really got to be paying attention to what they're saying, to their, their views, their attitudes and their, their expectations. Um, our focus has got to be fo you know, to focused on targeting those. How do we keep them engaged? What do we do um, to ensure that they want to come and work for us? A lot of research um, on this, this generation, um, which I'll share some of it, and we've got um, more research coming later as well around that piece. But I want to do our own little um, straw poll. Um, we're going to do some, some on-the-fly research now in terms of, you know, in one word, or maybe two or three if you're struggling with one, how would you describe Gen Z? And what goes in the room stays in the room. <laughs> And I'm biased because, like I said, I live with a couple of them, so I'm not going to put anything. Let's now see what the actual, some of the other research says. So this has come from Stanford Research and Talent LMS. So what they're saying is um, there's a lot more to share than this. There's tons and tons of stuff out there. But we're seeing this um, concept of them being collaborative, self-reliant and pragmatic. I don't know whether we saw a lot of that on um, on our slide. Um, digital natives, so they have never known the world without the internet, which they're the first generation, obviously, that are going through that experience. I think that definitely came out in the the, the, the word cloud there. Also, the most diverse generation um, to ever have been. Um, I think it's really interesting on those this, the points on the on the right there. So. But as, as, as employers, we need to take note of salary matters, DEI matters, work-life balance matters, and having some flexibility in their role matters as well. So, like I said, so much research that is out there. We've just pulled out some sort of interesting points here um, for, for discussion. So what does this mean for us as employers, as recruiters? We've got to stay on our toes. We've got to be constantly rethinking what we're doing and adapting our approach um, as needed. So we need to use assessments that allow us to operate at pace, processes that allow us to operate at pace, no more long dragged out processes, thinking, you know, in a manner that, you know, okay, I need the pace, but this has got to operate in a fair way as well. So when we look at some of the research around things like CVs and application forms, you know, there's inherent bias that is coming out, you know, when people are continuing to, to use those. Traditional assessments don't necessarily bring that whiz-bang factor. You're not getting that candidate engagement. So it's looking for an alternative that allows you to kind of retain that engagement and that interest from candidates. 
unstructured interviews. I've kind of never really advocated use of those, but this is just kind of making it more and more important that we need to be really focused on how we are assessing these these, these people. Um, we are still seeing people using these outdated assessment methods that just don't cut it with this generation and aren't taking their expectations into account. And if we want the best of the best, then that is something we've got to be got to be considering. I think you know, impatient was a word that came that came up on there, you know, we're no longer going to see people that will. I, I was just reminiscing about when I, I used to work for um, another test provider back in the early 2000s, and we would literally sit people in a room and they would be filling in psychometric tests for three or four hours, and, the, you know, each test was an hour long, and that was just the expectation. But, you know, now we are developing tests that, you know, people want to just fill them in and, and move on. But for me, we've got to retain that robustness and that science element um, of the assessments as well, it's finding the balance, the sweet spot across all of that. Um, so in terms of how we are going to future proof our assessments, so our focus needs to shift. So, for example, let's look at skills and potential, not necessarily just the words. Um, we need to design an assessment process. Um, Perhaps it doesn't matter what university you went to. Does a first class degree actually predict that you're going to be, you know, a better leader? Not necessarily. If you've got adaptability and drive, then maybe that's a better predictor of success further, further down the line. Whether you went to a Russell group or not, perhaps less important. So just being mindful of that. Um, CVs are, you know, the research is showing there's a lot of chat GPT going on. We were talking about this only at the coffee earlier, you know, there's a lot of ways that people are trying to cheat the system. People have always tried to cheat the system when it comes to CVs, let's face it, if you've got a parent that's pretty switched on, you've got a better CV than someone who hasn't got a parent that's, that's switched on. So let's look at what our alternatives are. I think the other point to make is this need for pace. So we need to be instilling assessment systems um, that allow us to make decisions quickly. Um, you know, so people aren't hanging around waiting for weeks and months before they get decisions, you know, that things can move very, very quickly. Engagement also not going to go away. So as we've just said, they won't suffer through a poor candidate experience or they won't be happy suffering through a poor candidate experience. So how can we make, bring it to life for candidates more? And if that wasn't hard enough, we've also got to do this in a way that supports our diversity goals um, as well. So it's we're just keeping that, in, you know, the, the engagement, but also, the science as well. Let's not forget that, you know, these decisions are huge. We're, we're making decisions about people's lives. So for me, that fundamental robustness of an assessment cannot be glossed over. I'm biased because I'm a psychologist and I design them and, you know, I've designed them for, for a long time. But I think those fundamentals haven't changed. They've got to be based on good science. We're fortunate in that the technology's moved on so that we are now able to create assessments that are shorter and more engaging and retain that robustness. But I sort of a message that I want to get across to you as recruiters, um, basically. Um, so again, this might be back to basics for, for some of you, but I think it is worth reiterating. So how do we um, you know, work towards formulating a plan that's a good one for early careers hiring? Um, for me, one of the basic um, foundations is what do what are we looking for what does great look like um if we don't know that then the whole the rest of the process is completely futile we need to understand what we need from those early careers applicants so we can achieve that in so many different ways the chances are you'll have data from previous years intakes i know not all of you some of you are beginning your journey in early careers hiring uh, from what we're talking about earlier but you've got data you can look at the you know those that have been successful and less successful as the programs have been sort of um, progressing validation studies again i'm biased because i'm a psychologist but linking that data from your recruitment process to the development training program you know what has actually been predicting success in that regard what are the actual skills that these 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 um, early careers employees are going to need like really drilling down into understanding that and recognizing that they're probably going to change quite a lot in the next few years you know a big broad competency framework probably isn't going to be cutting it um you know in in future we need to really hone in on what those skills are and being able to dial things up and dial things down easily as well so year on year accepting that it might be change so you've established what great looks like Next point then is looking at, well, how do we decide who's best um, suited? You know, what, what we, we know what the skills are, so we need to make a decision on who the best candidate is going to be. So this is about looking at that entire person to establish, you know, who's got the most potential to come into your organisation, to take it into the, into the future. So what skills are they bringing? 
What's driving those individuals? Are they going to fit with the culture of the organisation? You know, some people might look very, very similar, but they, you know, if they're driven by different um, elements, then they're probably, they might be more suited to one place than, than another. How are they going to work in a team? So just looking at them holistically, what are the things that really matter? And then making decisions based only on those criteria. Then, of course, it's kind of thinking more about the, the longer term. So what potential are they showing? Not just what can they do now, but what will they be able to do with support as the programme progresses? Um, how can we link that to our, our onboarding? I, I ran a session on this a while back. You know, let's not throw that data away. You've done all that work. You spent hours you know, recruiting someone. So let's learn from that and then let's use that data to sort of tailor any, any onboarding with them as well. Um, also thinking about how your early careers programme is linked to your organisational strategy, your organisational KPIs. Some of that's likely to be needed to, uh, you know, to adapt over time as well as organisations need to adapt in order to, to thrive. So what should we be, um, what should we be assessing? Um, our research has identified these as the key skills that are needed for now and into the future. I'm not saying I'm going to be standing here this time next year and sharing the same slide because the chances are I might not be. Um, but it's, it's really important that we do look at these people holistically. If we think, think about some of these seven that are on there, so um, something like drive, we can, how motivated that, that individual is, is going to really affect how well they kind of work for you in the organisation. With adaptable, thinking about how likely they are going to be able to operate in a changing landscape where things are changing rapidly. Learning focus innovating both really important will they be interested to learn as they grow um, and will their tendency for innovation help your organization to kind of continue to to progress and to move on now for the science bit as um, they used to say on the shampoo advert um, so just again a reminder of what we should be looking for in assessment providers or in your you know in your internal assessment processes so the back to basics still count reliability validity, fairness, you know, if ever you're working with a provider, you need to be talking to them to understand what they can, what they can offer in that regard. They might have some glossy brochures, but when you dig a bit deeper, what's the science actually telling you? How grounded is that, that, that assessment in science? Also, you can be thinking about um, looking at, you know, at every stage in the process, are your decisions fair? Are you making decisions which are aligned with your DEI strategy? You can consider analysing your own data. So you might go to a provider that might have data, go, here you go, we've, we've proven this thing's fair. But actually, if you've got data from every stage in your process, there's nothing stopping you drilling down, dr drilling back into that data to understand, you know, are you making fair decisions at each point in the process? Linked to that, then that centralisation of data is really, really useful to have as well when you're working with a provider. So if you can link the data up, then it just makes for a kind of a more holistic view of the process and what you're doing. Um, and then the predictive validity of your assessment. So how well are those decisions that you're making and the assessments that you're using predicting longer term success? So you might have an assessment process. They're not, they don't come cheap, let's face it. Are you looking at whether it's actually doing what it's, what it's promised that it's going to do? And there's, there's ways and means of ensuring that you can sort of track that data as well. So we always try to leave with some key takeaways, some practical recommendations. So for me, some of the key ones here is start with a decent grounding. What does success look like in your organisation at this point in time on that programme that you're recruiting people onto? What are the key skills that are needed in that role? Um, because if you don't know this, the whole rest of the exercise is completely futile. You really need to establish what, 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 what great looks like. Also about taking um, engagement as front and centre. So how do you excite this candidate? How do you keep them engaged throughout that whole process? How can you excite them without losing the rigour of your process? Um, Take all steps that you can to ensure that fairness and consistent, you're fair and consistent at every stage. Make decisions using the data. Don't make them based on the gut instinct. Um, and then finally, use all of the tools you've got to be prepared to review what you're doing, adjust what you're doing, and be able to adapt what you're doing going into the future. So if, you, if you scan that QR code, I think all of the resources from today are going to be put into that room and a few extras as well. So that might be just a useful one for you to take, um, perhaps while we're doing the, anybody's got any questions?